Good morning. This is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is January 8th, 2001. And this morning we are pleased to have with us Robert Davis. Robert, Bob, how are you today? Very well, thank you. You're looking well. Uh, may I ask you how old you are? Oh, 77 years of age. 77, and what is your current address? Street, Natick. And current marital status? I'm a widower. And do you have any children, Bob? I had four children, two boys and two girls. How about grandchildren? Six. Any great-grandchildren yet? Nothing yet. Okay, <laughs> nothing yet. Maybe when you get home. <laughs> Might be. Where were you born, Bob? I was born right here in Natick. You're a townie. A town, yeah. An I'm, absolute I'm genuine native. townie. Yeah, I'm native. Good for you. And you were raised in Natick all your I life? I was raised, educated in Natick, graduated from Natick High School, and... That makes it official. That, official. Okay, you were a townie. What was the community like as you grew up in it? Can you tell us about that? Well, uh, we never realized, uh, they said it was in the Depression, but uh, you know, I never realized it was as bad as it was. I had a good childhood. I had three brothers. I had a twin, two older brothers. And uh, we, we did well. Uh, I lived up in Cat Hill for years. I was born and I've lived in three houses since the time I've been in the town of Natick. You said Cat Hill? Cat Hill. Where is that? That is up off of Pond Street. It's between uh, Pitt Street and uh, Oakland Street. Okay. There's an area they have different sections of town, Cat Hill, Squash End, Popeville. Uh, they had the flats up in uh, Kansas Street there, the sand pits, Felshville. And w it, was that the original high school, or where was the high school at that time? The original high school, when I went to high school, was the old town hall, which is now the parking lot. Oh, yeah. That's where I went to high school. Okay. And it torn down about two years ago, something yeah. like that. And yeah. Uh, that was the high school, and of course they had Coolidge Junior High. That was the high school in 1938, when my oldest brother graduated. So, uh, and, and one of your brothers is a twin, is that correct? That was my brother. He's deceased. He was okay. my twin brother. Okay. What was your family background? What, what did your dad do? My father was a chauffeur. He worked for a doctor here in Ban uh, Dr. Bancroft. He worked for him for over 40 years. He, the doctor himself passed away in 1925. And uh, my father stayed on as handyman and chauffeur for his wife and stayed with her until she, mm -hmm. until she passed away. And what about your mom? My mother was a <clears throat> housekeeper. She uh, uh, took care of the house and uh, kept us occupied and made sure that we towed the, towed the mark, as I say. A good mother. Yes, good yeah. mother. When you we're growing up in Natick and you became, and you went through the school system and you uh, obviously heard about what was going on in the rest of the world. Were you aware of the fact of, of events in Europe or the Orient, what, what Japan was doing? We were aware of it, but I, I didn't pay any attention to it. I was in Connecticut when uh, working in Connecticut when uh, Hitler went into Poland and it made all the news. But uh, I, I never paid too much attention to what was going on. I just went along to my own page. That was, that was 39, yeah. so you were, um, you know, so I can do the math here. You're in high school? Yeah, I was in high school. And did you ever think that perhaps you might be affected by the events in Europe? No, I really didn't. Never did. How about December 7th, 1941? Oh, that day I remember. I was playing football down where the uh, housing development is now off of uh, South Main Street, Bennett Street, and High Street and Forest Avenue. We were playing football there on December 7th. 
one of the boys had to go home for a moment and came back and told us that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor. We all thought he was crazy. Then we all went back to the house and sat up by the radio for the rest of the night listening to all the news. How old exactly were you then? Uh, I was uh, 18 years old. And was there a draft in effect at that time? I had registered for the draft, yes. There was a draft in effect. I had already registered Did for the you draft. have a number? Did you know when you were going to be called up? No, no, I didn't know when I was going to be called up. I know I had registered for the draft and <clears throat> taken the physical. Uh, then, in 1943, I got a letter from Franklin D. Roosevelt saying that I had been selected to join the club. What happened uh, between 41 and 43? I graduated from high school in 42 and went to work for the uh, then known as the Boston and Albany Railroad as a station baggage man at the Trinity Place Railroad Station in Boston, Back Bay. And I was there until I was taken into the service in April of 43. April of 1943, you right. got this nice letter from Franklin yeah. Delano Roosevelt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you were drafted into the services. Yeah. Did you have any choice as to what service you would join? Oh yeah, I had my choice. But they offered me the Navy, the Marines, or the Army, but I figured I might as well walk as much as I could. I didn't like water that much, so I, I took the Army. Okay, where, where were you inducted? I was inducted uh, at the Army base of the Armory on Commonwealth Avenue in Boston. That's where I was sworn in. And then they sent us home for a week. And the following week we came back and took the train to Worcester and then I went to Fort Devens. When you went into the service, did friends or family, anybody you knew, go in with you? Were you pretty much on your own? It was pretty much on our own. There was only one fellow that I knew when I went in, and that was a lad from South Natick, Glenn Caswell, and he was inducted the same time and went to Fort Devens the same time as I did, but he went out of the Wellesley draft. He registered for the draft in Wellesley, and he was drafted from Wellesley the same time that I was hitting Natick. And did you see Glenn again during the time we in the went service? Through, uh, we went through basic training at Fort Lee, Virginia for about eight weeks, then he split to advanced training. I don't know where he went after that. He went his way and you yeah. went yours. So after basic training, let's get back to this. You're in Boston, you're inducted. Um, where were you sent for training? Well, I went to Fort Devens. I stayed in Fort Devens for eight days. And then they shipped us by train to uh, Fort Lee, Virginia by way of the Hoosick Tunnel and Troy, New York. and took us two and a half days to get from Ayer to uh, Petersburg, Virginia, to the base. Two and a half days? Two and a half days, yeah. You could have walked faster, couldn't you? At that time, possibly. <laughs> but uh, it was a long trip. What happened to you at Fort Devens? You were there only eight days. Was this just paperwork and That was just paperwork and uh, lining you up against the wall and have practice with the needles to give the follows a chance to see mm -hmm. if they could uh, give you injections. How was their aim? Oh, you, you felt it. <laughs> you felt it. They, they, you knew you were being hit. Okay, at, at Fort Lee, had you ever, I'm not going to say been out of Natick, but was this your first trip to go anywhere? You'd been to Connecticut before? No, I, I, I had traveled in the past when I was in school at uh, it was my father's occupation. <clears throat> we used to be in Natick here until after Thanksgiving, and then the Saturday after Thanksgiving, we'd travel to Florida and spend the winter down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So you'd been in the South. So and, I had been in the South, and, yeah. uh, and I went to school in the South. We'd be down there from probably November till April. We'd probably get home around uh, Patriot State in time for the uh, for the race. Tell us about uh, Fort Lee, Virginia. 
What did you do there? Well, Fort Lee, Virginia was the training base for the Quartermaster Corps Service of Supply. I went down there and I went into a training regiment and uh, we went through the actual basic training, uh, oh, close out of drill, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, go for long walks, 15, 20 mile hikes. But we were fortunate, the battalion I was in was uh, the honor battalion, so we usually had the pleasure of walking out on the hike. But when it came time to come back to camp, they usually brought some trucks out and let us ride back, save the shoes. And, uh, but uh, I spent uh, from uh, uh, probably the first of May, I spent about uh, five months in Virginia taking advanced training. I went to advanced training for uh, driving trucks and then... Was, was this at Fort Lee as well? This was at Fort Lee and yeah. uh, started out with the small trucks and then worked my way up into the uh, bigger trucks into tractor trailer units and heavy, heavy equipment. So your training would suggest to you at this time that you were going to be in, in the quartermaster of the United States Army. That's that's what I was. That's what I figured. And you when got five months of this. I got five months of that. Yeah. And then, uh, did you develop what? What did you like or dislike about it? Well, it was interesting, but uh, you, 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 if you made a mistake, you knew about it. They they, they advised you. They, right? they advised you. Yeah. yeah. They had they had choice ways of doing it, but uh, it didn't hurt you. But Still, you didn't like it. Did you develop uh, close relationships uh, with other guys uh, during basic training? There was one fellow. advanced training. There was one fellow that I met that came from Springfield. Uh, we joined up in advanced training, and uh, he stayed with me all the time. And uh, through advanced training, then he went with me when uh, we shipped out and uh, they sent me to California. And but this fellow was with you too? He was with yeah. me then. And then <clears throat> we were out in California. We stayed out there until about the middle of November. And then the Army in its wisdom brought us all the way back and I wound up five miles away from where I had started. What did you do in California? We were out there in a replacement depot. Whereabouts? Uh, we were in Pittsburgh, California, which is just outside of Stockton. Mm -hmm. Stockton was the port of embarkation for the West Coast for the islands, and uh, so I thought that uh, I was going out there as a replacement, and I thought I was going west. Then they shipped us back to the East Coast. You felt when you were yeah. that far, you were going yeah. out into the Pacific. Yeah. Going out through the Pacific. Yeah. But that didn't happen? No, no, they... Uh, called us out of bed one morning, about two o'clock in the morning, and got all our gear, and we put it on a train. And they brought us back uh, to the East Coast by way of the Rocky Mountains and uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. We had our Thanksgiving dinner put on the train at Cheyenne, Wyoming, and we ate the dinner on the train and rode to uh, Virginia, where we went to uh, Camp Patrick Henry. And then we were started there and processed out of there, given our shots for overseas. And then on December 6th, 1943, uh, they loaded us on board the Empress of Scotland. Where, where, where did it, you ship uh, out of? Newport News. Yeah, and uh, that's a pretty big ship. She was a uh, British cruise ship and had been taken over as a troop ship. And I believe at the time that I went on it, uh, Jack Shackey, who was affiliated with the American Red Cross, and he and a bunch of American Red Cross representatives uh, were on their way. And uh, it took us seven days. We went alone, no convoy, across the Atlantic in December in bad water. And uh, I was one of the less fortunate ones who slept on the deck. Had you ever been to sea nights. before, Bob? Uh, 
in a rowboat. <laughs> yes, I took a, took a trip years ago from uh, New York City to Boston on the Eastern Steamship Line. Used to run a ship out of, Bo out of New York every evening at 5 o'clock and make an overnight trip to Boston. Tell us about being on a, on a troop ship in the North Atlantic uh, in the middle of the winter. What was it like? It wasn't nice. It was cold. And you say you were sleeping on the deck? And we slept on the deck. And uh, I wasn't alone. There were, I, I believe there were over 5,000 troops on the ship, so they couldn't all get below decks. But we took us seven days to get across, and then we uh, had, uh, we landed in uh, Casablanca. And uh, from there, they had a, uh, temporary camp set up in Casablanca for us. And that's where we celebrated our Christmas of 1943. And our meal was cooked at that time. They had Italian POWs doing all the cooking. And uh, we paid the consequences. <laughs> The food wasn't that good? Oh, the food was wonderful, but it was the after effects. I see. So it, okay. it lasted, and uh, it, was a, it was a horrendous deal. I was in Casablanca for about two weeks. Did you have any idea why you were there? This was not, not particularly central to what was going on in the world. Not war. an inkling. I figured that if I was in North Africa, I was going to be going across to Italy. But uh, I didn't have an iota of what we were going to do. And then they shipped us from Casablanca and they put us on what in World War II was referred to as the 40 and 8. During World War II in France, they won. The first and eight, world, the first first world, world war. war. Yeah. They would put 40 men and eight horses in a boxcar. And that's how they transported the troops. And they had the same Dan cars in North Africa. And I rode those 40 and 8 cars from Casablanca to Algiers and then backtracked to Oran over a period of two weeks and then got on a Greek ship and went from Oran through the Mediterranean, down through the Suez Canal, into the Gulf of Aden, and then eventually wound up in Bombay, India. Okay, let's stop for a minute here. From Casablanca up to Algiers and then to Oran, what was it like? Because the thousands of guys were funneling through there going into the, uh, the North African theater. Uh, what did you see? What did, what did it feel like to be part of this? I saw plenty of sand. We traveled at night. We traveled during the daytime, but you couldn't see anything. And uh, we, landed, we landed in Oran, uh, or in Algiers, about 11.30 at night. It was raining like the devil. And I remember getting off the train, but uh, you, didn't, you didn't take too much look at the landscape because it was nothing but desert land and arid and uh, when it rained it rained did you have any idea where you were bound for now not a word you're not on your way word. to india and nobody suggested no, that, nobody uh, nobody told no. us where we were going and how many of your unit was with you were with you with the group i Are was you, with there were probably about 150 men and you were all members of the Quartermaster we all court. started out as quartermaster, and uh, our officers were also quartermaster officers. Okay, so you sail east all the way down the Mediterranean. Were you at any time under fire or we, uh, bombed? We did. We lost. We the Mediterranean was a little rough, and we were traveling through the Mediterranean, and we lost one ship in the convoy. You were now in a convoy. We were in a convoy, yeah. and we lost one ship in the convoy. But they wouldn't, uh, on that trip, that was on the Nea Hellas, was a Greek ship, they wouldn't let us out on deck after deck. 
you didn't go out on deck. And when they had the problem, everybody had to stay below decks or inside. The, they wouldn't let them walk on the deck because of security, I suppose. Somebody light a match to light a cigarette. Mm -hmm. Shows, even a little light shows up, so. But that's... Uh, was that just at night, or were you, you allowed In the daytime, out? you could come out on deck. Yeah. And... Uh, could you ever see anything? A lot of other ships. And a lot of water. How about aircraft over your head? Were you bombed? Never what was sank too, the never, ship? Never saw too much aircraft. What sank the ship in your convoy? The ship that was sunk of the convoy was sunk by a torpedo. A torpedo. Yeah. So subs were after you. There were subs in the area. Yeah. And you're yeah. on your way to Port Said. Yes. Yes. We went through Port Said and uh, down through down through the Gulf of Aden, then across into Bombay. So, uh, At what point did you find you're on your way to India? When I saw the Gulf of Aden and I saw the Aden port in the background, I figured we were going someplace else or India. They go a little further east. That's about the only time I knew. We, we very, had very little knowledge of where we were going. We got into Bombay and uh, then we tried another trip went by train from Bombay to Calcutta. Okay, at this point in your career, uh, what was your specialty? My, my specialty or my, uh, my specialty was heavy equipment operator, truck driver heavy. Mm -hmm. That's what I was classified as. And that's so what you I were waiting to get some place to use this Expected to be skill. doing, yeah. Would you rather have done something else in all the uh, careers that are in the quartermaster? They didn't offer you too much when you were there, when you were, they put you through the process. They, they said, you, you, and you, and this is it. And you became a truck driver. They, as far as tests and such like that, they didn't have it as they have today. They, they decided they needed truck drivers. They needed so truck were, drivers, yeah. so uh, you were selected. You were a guy from Natick, Massachusetts, and yeah. you go into the service, and you wind up uh, on the shoulder of Africa, and then go through the um, the Straits of Gibraltar. You did the military prepare you for uh, the different cultures you were encountering first at North Africa, and now on the subcontinent? Well, when you got on the ship when we just before we got into Gibraltar, or just before yeah, just before we got into Casablanca. Uh, they gave us a French English dictionary, and uh, then lined us up and gave us some more shots for tetanus or something that was prevalent in the area at the time. And they told you to read the book and uh, not to make any overt moves and to uh, watch your p's and q's. But uh, more or less, you were on your own. Because the uh, environment in Casablanca at the time I was there, they, they weren't too happy with the Americans. And there was the Vichy French, mm -hmm. and they were, still, they were still fighting the war. And that's one reason why the Jean Bat was sitting there. They didn't want to surrender it, so they scuttled it right in the middle of the island. Would you explain that that's a, sh a French battleship? That was a French battleship. Would you explain why it was sunk or how? Well, they they uh, they scuttled it right at the right at the dock and uh, just let it lay on its side there. And the, had been there for months. They just didn't want to give it up to the uh, Germans. And uh, rather than have the Germans get a hold of it, they let it lay on its side there. This is and the so-called free French. The free French, yeah. yeah. And uh, they just let us stay there. And. As far as I know, I, I it could still be there today. I don't know, but uh, they just they just left it. They didn't want it to go into foreign hand. They didn't want the Germans to get a hold of it. Tell us about yeah. going through the Suez Canal. Well, Suez Canal was a, you know, was, I, I enjoyed the trip. I mean, in the daytime hours, you get out and look over the side and watch the waves, watch the other ships, but uh, activities were limited. You did calisthenics once you got to find a space enough where they get 
50 guys to jump up and down and exercise unless you do it, but uh, most of your time on shipboard was free and uh, they found ways to entertain themselves, the other troops, and, which they did quite. You say, is that all you got to see of Egypt, that is Port Said, and then that's about it? Went through Cairo, Port Said, and uh, down through the canal, and uh, saw saw plenty of sand on the side of it, but the, the, and the, and the Egyptian fishing boats and everything else. But uh, at that age, you're 19, 20 years old. You, you didn't realize and you didn't appreciate what you were seeing or what you were doing. And at this point, you still had no idea where you were going? No, not Boy. the faintest. Not the faintest. As I said, when I saw Aiden off the back of the ship, I figured we were going someplace further west. And that was it. So uh, then we got into Bombay, and uh, the, learned the learned the lesson there that we had a unit commander with us who loved to walk and loved to march, and uh, we were there for 24 hours, and he had us out at nine o'clock in the morning to go for a walk, and we went on a hike and. Uh, we got back around two o'clock in the afternoon, and, but that was the only time we took a hike during the uh, midday hours, because then he was informed that, uh, as the old English saying goes, only mad dogs, dogs and Englishmen, and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. <laughs> That's right, and American recruits. From the American <laughs> recruits, well, from then on, if we went for hikes, it was done after five o'clock in the afternoon when the sun set. And uh, then you got a uh, lesson when you are. I got a lesson in Bombay as to the value of life. And you'd walk or we'd be marching through the town and you'd see these burning gats or pillars and, uh, of people who had passed away and they'd just put them on these pyres and light them on fire and cremate them right there in public. That was one of their rituals, and uh, I saw a few of those. It didn't make me feel too good, but uh, it was something I wouldn't want. Let me ask you again then, did the Army prepare you for uh, these very exotic things that you were seeing and experiencing? No. Or you feel no. you were just passing through? You were just passing through. They handed you a book on uh, Indian culture, and uh, as you came in, as I said, you got into North Africa, they did a book on French, and you got into India, they gave you another book that uh, gave you a few clues to the language and to the habits and to the customs, and uh, you were to act accordingly. And that was what we did, what we tried to do. How long were you in Bombay? I was in Bombay for a week. And then we took a train and went across India from Bombay to uh, Calcutta. And it was on the train that I met a fellow who came from Natick. And he used to run a riding stable down at Lookout Farm. His name was Boyle. And he used to run a riding stable at Lookout Farm in South Natick for years. And he was over there with a uh, group that were taking mules into the hills of Burma in China. And he was a mule team. And he uh, was on the same train that I was. That uh, I lost him. I lost him when uh, we got to uh, Calcutta, where I went to uh, Camp Kanchurpara, which was a uh, as I say, another relay station. They took the recruits from there, and it was there that I was assigned to a uh, stock group. Uh, they made an auditor out of me, in a way. I went out with a group of team to uh, take an inventory of the uh, Calcutta area and the outlying areas where they had government supplies, military supplies. And we inventoried the whole uh, China Burma theater okay, from so Calcutta. <clears throat> this is a 
<clears throat> excuse me, a very important change in your career. You were trained in the quartermaster, and As now suddenly driver. you're doing something totally yeah. different. Were other guys Same thing. from your Same unit thing. taken and They needed a pool. Yeah. No and more truck driving. No more truck driving. Now yeah. you're a pencil pusher. And you go out and you take inventory. Did you like that better than what you'd been It was interesting. To? It was interesting. To, uh, I never realized I had the amount of supplies that they did have. Okay, tell us, when you're supposed to go out and assess uh, the equipment that you find in a particular place, did, did you start at Calcutta? We started at Calcutta, and we started at uh, Calcutta at the uh, central pool there. Then we went out to the outskirts. We, there was Budge Budge. At an Air Force station out there, we had to go out and inventory all of their parts. This is a group maybe of 100, 120 people. Okay. Yeah. How do you do that? How do you literally count what they've got? And did you know how much they're supposed to have? No. No, we no, had no idea what they were supposed to have. We were sent out with a clipboard and a pencil, and uh, they had to point to one area and say, that's it. No. And write down what we got and bring it back in and let them figure it out someplace else. What did they do with the information you supplied? I suppose at that time, uh, supplies getting into China wouldn't go by, uh, well, they had no land traffic going to China. Everything had to be flown from Burma, uh, from Burma and from India into China. Nothing went over the road. The, bar, uh, the uh, Burma Road was blocked off. They weren't doing anything. And the Japanese were on the Burma Road. They were up around Lash Hill. And uh, at this time, I was in Calcutta with the pencil pushing gree, uh, crew. And uh, in the time I was in Calcutta, I used to, after we got through with the inventory, I was put back into the pool for replacements, and uh, eventually I was sent from Calcutta to join an outfit up in Chaboy, which was in the upper part of Burma, and it was at an air station, and there I joined uh, an engineer battalion or an engineer group. Uh, it wasn't a big group, it was, it's, uh, that was my final final trip that I took, and that was when I was signed to the Burma Road Engineers. Okay, you, you've, you've just taken another yeah. big geographic yeah. leap here. Yeah. Tell us, Calcutta has a reputation all of its own. What were your impressions of this place? Probably one of the most then crowded cities in the world. Well, Calcutta was a, a, was a beautiful city, but it's, it was like a cook's tour. If you went on a cook's tour, they showed you all the highlights of the city. When you went in the military, uh, you didn't have a cook's tour. You saw how the, how the regular citizens lived. Uh, you worked in the areas of the city where uh, you had uh, wild livestock and goats and people sleeping on the streets and sleeping under pieces of uh, cardboard. But you saw that you saw the seamy side of life. You didn't uh, spend all your time in the city with the Grand Hotel. And in the center of Calcutta, there was a common, and they had a big uh, looked like a temple at one end of it. But you, the the main artery going down the middle of it was equivalent to an eight-lane highway. But you never walked down there because at the time I was there. The British had the Royal Air Force, and they had Spitfire fighter planes that used the concourse in the middle of Calcutta as a landing strip and a takeoff strip. So that if they had problems, they did get bombed, and they did get strafed by enemy forces in Calcutta. Not by the I Japanese? By the Japanese, but it was before I got there. Where, wh who were the English operating against? The English were operating against the Japanese. The Japanese were in Lashio in Burma, 
and they had air bases, and they were they were flying over, and uh, I never saw I saw Japanese planes uh, when I was up in the hills, and we came across uh, our travels. We came across Japanese equipment. We came across Japanese helmets, and the Japanese used to, uh, were fanatics, and they used to carry the Japanese flag inside their helmet, and. Uh, it was a trophy if you found one. You used the, the phrase uh, up in the hills. Um, the hills of what? The Naga Hills of uh, Burma, outside of uh, Michinaw. Uh, when we went, first went into Burma with the Burma Road Engineers, we went in to build a road. We were going to build what they eventually called the Tenchung Cutoff, which was 90 miles of road from uh, Saidon in Burma to Tenchang, China, and it was a it was a straight path. Whereas the the Burma road came out of uh, Saidon and went south into Burma into Mandalay, and then cut back up again to come back into Tenchang, China. So we cut off that. L that they made there, and we did 90 miles of road to make the traffic a little easier. And okay, you've you've changed careers again. Okay. Uh, you are now an engineer. Supposedly, how, yes. How, how did that happen? Well, I was assigned to the Burma Road Engineers as a heavy equipment operator, as a heavy truck driver, and uh, from that, uh, you call it on the job training. Learned how to operate bulldozers, learned how to operate uh, road graders, and uh, what they call the turno pans uh, to level the road off, and uh, and I also learned how to grease the foolish things, and that's you, the first thing you learn. A little earlier, you told us about uh, the fact that nothing was getting into the area of operation yeah. except by air. Yeah. This is going over the hump. As, as That's right. Or, uh, did you have anything to do uh, with the guys at that end of the line, the the airports or uh, the areas that uh, service the planes? No, no. Primarily, no. We were we were a uh, road crew. We were a construction crew, and our primary thing, our out our outfit, really, as far as I can recall, uh, never had over 200 men, and that included the officers. We had one group in uh, Saidon, and then we had another group that started in Tenchang, and they worked their ways towards each other. And uh, so, uh, no, we primarily worked on that 90-mile stretch of road, and uh, that's where we were, that's, uh, that's where I was for Twenty some odd months. What was your relationship with the Chinese? The Chinese that we ran into were the average. Uh, we didn't. Uh, I didn't have too much doing with the Chinese military. Uh, the Chinese uh, coolies, as you call them, are. But we had more or less. We dealt mostly with Burmese and with what they called uh, Kachins and Gurkhas. Gurkhas were a specialty force of the British Army. Reconnaissance, and they were they were smart. They These were, were first-class troops. They were first-class troops. Yes, and uh, you had to respect them, and they were known for their their knives, and I guarantee you they were sharp. You guys are on bulldozers. Uh, yeah. What were the the Chinese and the Burmese using? Did they have equipment equal to yours? No, no. We had the equipment. We had the equipment as far as that goes. They were the Chinese that we had working with us were mostly for manual labor. We put in bridges. We put up barely bridges, but we used them for manual labor. They were. We had Chinese American uh, Chinese engineers who were educated in the states working in conjunction with our engineers on the road. And uh, they were educated. 
and they were good to work with. But uh, the majority of the ones that we worked with were the were the uh, grunt and groan guys that did all that. I drove truck over there. I drove uh, tractor trailers, and uh, I don't think there was much that I didn't drive that was over there. And you were there 20 months, I think you just said. I was. I got there in. Uh, yes, I left there in. De I left there. Left uh, Burma in uh, September. Of 44. Of 45. 45. And uh, flew back from Kunming, China, to Calcutta. And then, uh, when I got back to Calcutta, I stayed in Calcutta for about three weeks, waiting for a ship to get home on the point system. Because okay, Bef before you get home, um, you've you've had advantages that I think a lot of people would like to have. Uh, no more details of what was the weather like in in the places you were in, and were uh, were you guys properly clothed? Was the food good? Were your officers good? Tell us about the the, the twenty months that you spent in a in a pretty remote area. When we first started out over there, the food was good. We had our own we had our own cooks. We drew our rations from uh, Michinaw, Burma. Uh, after the uh, Merrill's Marauders came in and cleaned up Michinaw, and the American forces took it back over, then they could bring aircraft in, they could fly supplies into Michinaw. We got our supplies, and we had our own cooks, and uh, get rations out of the Army. They'd furnish the rations. So the food, the food wasn't that bad. The weather was another thing. Because you could be out there in the sunshine, and uh, within 20 minutes you'd be up to your knees in mud, and in half an hour you'd have the water up to your ankles because of the monsoons. So during the monsoon season, you didn't uh, do too much work on the road because whatever you're pushing away with the bulldozers, uh, you're making a mud pile. So you had to slow down, and that slowed us down quite a bit. But uh, the uh, officers, they were all good. As a matter of fact, there was an officer that I went overseas with out of uh, Patrick Henry, and he stayed with us all the time that I was in India and all the time I was in Burma. He was assigned to my outfit in Burma there. And uh, then when I got back out of the service, uh, I ran into him up here at the Natick Labs. He had been reassigned to the Natick Labs as the adjutant up here at the Natick Labs for several years. What was your rank at this time, Bob? I was a corporal, and that's about as high as I got. You've, you've talked about China, you've talked mm -hmm. about Burma, you've mm -hmm. talked about India. Is there a particular place you remember as being a place you'd like to go back and see now? It struck you as being quite not really. different from Natick. Not really. There was no. nothing. There was nothing there that, that turned me on, that, that made me want to go back. I was there. It was uh, something that uh, uh, you didn't want to miss, but I don't think I'd want to go through it again. You know, I I've seen and uh, we had uh, we had good times and we had some some sour times too, he had some bad times. But I will say that on the 90 miles of road that we did, that we only lost one man. And I think that's a pretty good record for the conditions that we were working under. Uh, we what happened to We lost him? equipment, yeah. but uh, we only lost one man. So. Let's explore something yeah. you just said. You talked about good times and bad times. Tell us about some of the good times. Well, good times. Uh, you were in, when we were in Calcutta there, we got free time. We could go in. They had, uh, they had uh, clubs in Calcutta where the troops could go. And, of course, there was a little dissension over there, too, between the, 
the Yanks and the British. And uh, at that time, we were getting $50 a day once a month. And, uh, but the British were getting less than that. And the British were a little upset with the fact that the American soldiers were there. And uh, when they hire the, well, when Calcutta, we stayed in a uh, private residence. You had two men to a room, and you had your own boy there. He came in, and you'd put your uniform down on the bed, and he'd take it out and wash it and press it and bring it back in again so you had clean clothes. And it cost you maybe a uh, dollar a week. But the British weren't paying that kind of money. They were only paying about uh, three or four annas, which is about uh, 20 cents. And uh, they thought the American troops were spoiling the whole proposition for them. Because Americans were walking around with dough and uh, they didn't have it to spend. And uh, the Indians wanted to work for the Americans instead of the English. They didn't like it. But there was a, there was a little dissension between the two troops. But uh, you just grin and bear it. And stay away. If you saw something coming, you turn around and walk away from it. And that's that's the way it was handled. What about the bad times? Well, the bad times are uh, you go to bed at night and you wake up in the morning, you get out of the rack and you step into a pool of water. It started rain overnight. The uh, drainage systems for the tents was uh, left a lot to be desired. And uh, conditions in some of the towns, some of the villages you had to go through. You had to be very careful in some of the villages because you didn't know uh, who was there, and of course they're talking in their own language and you don't know whether they're getting ready to give you a haircut or not. And uh, so you, you always kept someone on your back to take care of yourself. You always went with two or three so that you had a little help. But uh, I was very fortunate. I, I made it. and. Uh, I made the best of it as I could and uh, enjoyed it. Did you get into areas where you um, you looked around very carefully that you might uh, be subject to a attack directly from the Japanese? Well, we were we were subject to attack. But, but there were Japanese troops in the area. I never saw one. I saw evidence of them in the area. And at one time when we were at a, a road camp, when we were doing the road, we were at the road camp, we were all sitting by the fire, on a campfire situation. And of course, we had the luxuries. We had a generator, we had electric lights in our tents, and uh, the officers had their tents, and uh, it made 20 men would make up the complement of the whole base where we were. And we went in one night, and the captain went into his tent and came out, and he was a little upset because somebody had stolen the light out of his tent. And then we went back to check on it and found out that uh, all the papers of what we were going to be doing were all missing. So we had uh, night visitors. And come to find out that uh, we went out looking for them, and we found them. But they uh, were a couple of Chinese deserters from the Chinese army, and they spotted the tent, and they stole our maps, they stole the lights, and everything else. And of course, we got them, and then we turned them over to the uh, Chinese army. And uh, I don't know what happened to them after that, but uh, I, my own suspicion was I don't think they lasted too much longer after we turn them over. Discipline but, was rather the, the, the discipline was very yeah. big. If they, they had a party that was wounded, they would put them on the side of a river on a bed, and they would treat them as well as they could. They didn't have all the best equipment, but if the guy uh, passed away, they just, that's it. Mm -hmm. He didn't uh, seem to lose too much sleep over. Who were your closest friends in the military? I had one fellow from Springfield that he stayed with me until uh, I was shipped up into the hills, into the Burma Road Engineers. That's the last time I saw him. I didn't have too many, 
too many people that I was friendly with. Uh, I was a loner, but if I went someplace, I'd usually find company to go. But uh, I didn't have too many. Uh, one fellow that I was with in basic training, I met him 45 years later down at Fall River. And mm. uh, he didn't remember me, but I remembered him. And he was, uh, he's, matter of fact, he's living up in Maine now, but he was a country western singer. And he went through boot camp basic training with me and I lost track of him in Virginia. And then I'm down at a country western feet down in Fall River and he was there as the guest of honor singing. Was. And uh, that's one fellow that I knew very well in basic training and uh, I've reestablished the relationship with him. He was living in Rentham. Now he's moved up to New Harbor, Maine, so it's a little heavier to get there, but uh, I hope to get up and see him soon. Good. Take a ride up. In terms of communication, when you were in some of these uh, China, Burma, India, how did you hear about what was going on in the, in the rest of the war that you were not involved in? Central Europe, for example, or, or f the Far East? Well, we would get, uh, of course we had radio, but it was military radio. Newspapers were something to be desired. You got stars and stripes, but that came out once a month. Uh, the general knowledge of what was going on, you, you, you didn't hear too much what was going on. I, we heard about the, the A-bomb uh, in Japan when they dropped the bomb and of course we got the news that when Roosevelt died that made the headlines and everybody stood up and paid attention to it. But uh, you, didn't get, you didn't get too much news. We were, we were a group of men, maybe 25 to 30 men in a base camp and we were out in the middle of no man's land. It would be, uh, when we got mail, you wouldn't get one letter at a time, you'd probably get 30 or 40 letters because they couldn't keep track of you. And uh, when it came time to get out of the military, to be uh, ushered out, to be uh, released, uh, we were an outfit that uh, nobody wanted. I started out in the Quartermaster Corps. I wound up in the engineers. And when I came time for discharge, they hung me onto the tail end of a signal battalion to get me back to the States so that I could get discharged. So when I was discharged, I was discharged out of the signal corps. And I wouldn't know the first thing about a signal. I used to do summer for as a Boy Scout, but I forgot all of that. Did you guys in the CBI, did you have a feeling that you were um, off in left field and that uh, people home, back home here knew what was going on in Europe and knew what was going on in the, in the prepping for the invasion of Japan? Did you feel left out of it? We were, we were the forgotten group. Anybody in the CBI, it doesn't matter. The, the Air Force, the CNAC, the pilots that uh, were flying uh, CNAC for the Chinese National Airways, they, uh, they were all, they were all uh, you were expendable, but uh, they didn't know who you were. They'd come up and they'd say, where were you? Or, where were you? Or, I was in the CBI. Where was that? Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, so uh, yes, there were there were a few people here right in Adic that uh, they're all deceased right now. But when we were in Burma and uh, building the road, they used to have to airdrop our supplies into us. They would uh, fly over and see forty sevens and kick the food, or kick the rice out of the window, be out of the plane. We had Chinese working with us and they used to fly over and they'd drop the rice out of the planes and uh, but you wanted to be sure you were someplace else when they dropped because they couldn't aim at all. It, it was considered bad for them to catch rice falling well, from they, the air. They used, to, they used to try to egg them to go out and catch a bag once in a while but uh, 
I, I've seen the end results of what happens when a 500 pound bag of rice hits you. So it's... It, it smarts, it, doesn't it? It smarts. Yeah. yeah. Were you, did you ever get time off to go to a, a, an area where no. you got R&R? &R? No. So you worked straight from through time, for your 20 months. From the time months. I got to Calcutta and was sent up into the hills, uh, after I left Michinaw, we never got R&R, uh, &R, rest and recreation. I was a figment of the imagination. That didn't exist. We stayed on the road and uh, worked the road to the best of our ability, and uh, that was it. No, you never got, you never got leave. You got paid once a month. You so you put in your time and just came home. Yeah. You, you said you left Burma in September of '45. Is that correct? I flew from Kunming, China, to Al to Calcutta in September of '45, and I left Calcutta in. Uh, First part of the middle part of November uh, on the uh, Marine Panther, which was a, an American Liberty ship. And then we returned to the United States. And we returned by the same way that we went over. Uh, we came up through Aden, up through uh, the Suez Canal, up Port Said, out through Cairo, back into the Mediterranean. And then we went to Gibraltar, left Gibraltar, and in the meantime, in Aden, we took on fuel. And while they were taking on fuel, they uh, hit the propeller of the ship, which was only a single propeller, and they knocked it out of line. So we couldn't attain top speed coming home because there was too much vibration. And the, ship's captain was anxious to get home and he didn't want to bother to have it fixed. So we came home, we got into uh, New York, we came across the North Atlantic at the same time that the wasp, I went through the, uh, the Straits of Gibraltar and the ship next to me going through the Straits of Gibraltar was the USS Wasp, the aircraft carrier. And that was when they came out into the Atlantic, they took the northern route to come back to the States. Well, we went, uh, we went straight across. And in their trip, they lost part of the bow of their ship because of the heavy seas and everything else on that crossing. There were, I can remember seeing pictures of the wasp, of the bow of the wasp, how the damage that it had caused by the waves when they were coming home. And we came across the central route, or the center of the Atlantic, and we had rough weather, but uh, nothing what they went through. And then we got outside of New York and the water turned to glass. So the captain decided he was going to make a run for it. So he made a run for New York Harbor. We got into New York Harbor at 5 o'clock in the morning. But they uh, had us drop anchor out in the harbor. They wouldn't let us come into port. And uh, the rumor was that they wanted us to see the Statue of Liberty lit up at night. <laughs> so we came in at night. They put us on ferry boats at the Brooklyn Navy base and then took us across New York Harbor so we could see the Statue of Liberty and dropped us off in New Jersey so we could get out of Camp Kilmer. And we stayed at Kilmer for four days, and uh, which was just paperwork. And then they transported us up to Fort Devens. And uh, I got to Fort Devens on the 19th of December in 1945. And then they processed us there. And uh, I was one of the fortunate ones. I got my discharge on December 24th. Home for Christmas. 1945. And uh, they were going to keep me at Fort Devens. They weren't going to let me come home for Christmas. They uh, were going to keep me there because I had to have dental work done. 
And I told him that I would take the alternate course that I would get the dental work done through the VA after I got home for Christmas. I'd come back later. Of course, they knew that I probably never would come back, but, but I did get my discharge on the 24th of December, and I was home for Christmas. So that was about the best Christmas I had had. That was one of the good things. That was one of the good days. Yeah. Yeah. Was there a, a most memorable experience in your career? You traveled a great deal and saw a lot of things. Something that pops up that you think about every once in a while. I can't find anything. I, 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 as I said, I enjoyed it. I, I made the best of it. It isn't something that uh, you wanted to do, but uh, then again, I'm glad I did it. And I'm glad I had the opportunity. Uh, they say many are called and few are chosen. Well, they called me and I, I went in and I did at that time. It, it was a different aspect a little later on. The viewpoint was a little different, but uh, I can't condemn or condone the actions of others. I went when I was called and uh, I did the best I could. Made the Well, that would have to be uh, Mr. Cheatham from Springfield. Uh, he had an awful habit, and he loved to gamble. And the only thing I could say about him was that uh, when we were traveling and moving, like on the ship going over to North Africa, the ship going from North Africa to Bombay, if he got into a card game, he always came out. You know, I, I was his bank. I'd loan him the money, he'd go broke, and I'd loan him the money, and he'd go out, and then we did very well on, on, when we were on ships. But when we got on a base on ground, he took me to the cleaners. <laughs> but uh, I lost track of him in uh, Calcutta. He signed another outfit. I really don't know what happened to him. But he was, he was a character in his own thought. He, Casablanca, he led me a merry chase for a few days, but uh, this is life. You do it. it. Sounds like you had a good well, time at times, yeah. I made, as I said, I made the best of it. Some of it was good, some of it was bad. At, with what rank did you, you, you were a corporal? When I you was a corporal when I, and when with I was what, discharged. And uh, what, what ribbons, what decorations did you have? I got the meritorious unit citation, and we got the good conduct medal. Because if you make 90 days, you'd make that, I guess. And uh, I got the Asiatic Pacific. I think I'm entitled to the uh, uh, African campaign. I was in Africa over 90 days, and, or over the 60 days, and then, of course, the ship being sunk in the convoy, I think I was entitled to that, but I don't know, and I've, I've never pushed it. I mean, uh, when it came time to get out, uh, like the majority of the others, you were just happy to get that piece of paper that says uh, goodbye. Yeah. You know, and uh, you joined the 50, free pass. Yeah. You joined the 5220 club for a year. 5220 club? Would you explain that? Well, that was something the state of Massachusetts gave you. I think uh, gave you twenty dollars a week for a year after you were discharged. And they'd send it every month. And then the state of Massachusetts gave you a bonus. I think it was a, I think it was a $200 bonus. I can't remember now. It was two or $300 a day. Gee, you could have bought a car with that. You could have at that time. Yeah. yeah. You could have at that time. But you, you, you can't even make the down payment on it now. <laughs> but, uh, but that was about it. And, uh, as I say, uh, this one fellow up in Maine, I'm going up and see him in the spring. Right about now, he's probably snowed in up in uh, New Harbor. But uh, he, was a, he was a character in himself, but he was a country western singer. And that's how I met him again. And after 45 after, years After or 45 something. years. Yeah. 
Bob, did you join any reserve unit when you got home? No. Was that no. the end of your military? That was uh, the end of my military. Yeah. I joined the, joined the VFW. You did join uh, that? Yes, I've been a member yeah. of the VFW. I'm a life member of the VFW. Okay. And uh, that was the only military organization I joined. I joined the uh, China Burma India Veterans Association, which is a very small group, probably consisted of maybe at the outside of 10,000 members. And that's about to be uh, abolished. It, they're going to give it three more years and then they're going to go into oblivion. Whether someone will pick it up and keep it going after that, I don't know. When but, you uh, came home to Natick um, in, dis in December of 40, Christmas 45, yeah. um, did, your f did you sit with your family and tell them where you'd been, what you did? Were they interested in your, in your military yeah. career? My father, well, before I, when I went into the service, I probably did a lot of other fellows did. I went down to Fairbanks and bought two world atlases. And I left one atlas with my father and I took the other atlas with me. And uh, we had a little system so that when I wrote letters home, I could tell them. You had a code. Had a code made up. Yeah. I could tell them where I was, so they, they were pretty well aware of where I was. For a period of six months while I was in Burma, we were, we were unknown. There was no communications with us or anything else. We were a lost group. Nobody knew where we were or what we were doing. But that was for about a six month period. That's when he got a barracks bag loaded with mail. But, uh, but my father knew and my parents knew. I, I was one of the ones that was one of the misfortunes. I lost a brother in World War II. Uh, he was with the 8th Air Force, flying mosquito bombers. Mosquitoes? And mosquitoes. Really? And uh, Mosquito was renowned for its structure. It was made of wood. And uh, he was flying with the 8th Weather Recon Squadron out of England. And they made a trip over, a flight over Leipzig, Germany, and they got shot up. And uh, we lost him over the English Channel. And at the time of the loss, he was just turned 22 years old, I believe. Now, was this your twin brother? No, this is my older brother. brother. I had, yeah. I had a, I had a brother that was eight years older. I had a brother that was 22 months older. That was the one that got killed, Bill. And then, of course, I had my twin. So uh, the bomber got shot up pretty badly over Leipzig, Germany, and they got back as far as the English Channel. And uh, from witnesses or from other aircraft in the flight, they said the thing just disintegrated in midair. And that was the last they saw of him. And that was. Four days before his birthday, he killed. Got killed on July, July seventh, nineteen forty, forty-four, I believe. That's so, right after D-Day. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but that. So he's. He's one of the gold stars you got on the wall out here on the side of the house. Bob, how important to you was serving in the military? I think it was something that at the time everybody did. I had no qualms about going into the military. I had no qualms. My brother. Whether it was a good judgment or a good decision or not, who can tell? He's just one of those poor unfortunates that uh, they closed him out too soon. Yeah. And 
you know, it's something to happen, but this is life. Do you feel that serving um, in the armed forces of the United States have affected your life, uh, the way you lived it afterwards? I believe it had an effect on it. I believe it had an effect on it. But, uh, I would say that it was a controlling factor. Uh, as I say, I got out of the service, went back to my old job on the railroad, stayed there for a few months, and then decided to go to other things. I finally wound up here working for the town of Natick for 29 years. So I enjoyed the time I had in the military service. I, I enjoyed the time I worked for the town. You had a point of view about uh, going into the military when you went in um, in 1943. How you felt about the war and the United States participation yeah. in it. Yeah. Looking back on it from now, do you share that, still share that point of view? I feel that it was the right thing. I feel that I did the right thing going in. Uh, I think everybody at that time, uh, it, you know, they, when we were in that age, in that age, 18 and 19 years old, we, we you didn't pay too much attention to what was going on. I think the biggest thing that ever happened prior to uh, uh, Pearl Harbor Day was uh, when the Squalus sank up off of New Hampshire there. I think that was the biggest news getter that I can remember up until Pearl Harbor Day. And I can remember that when that I was sitting on the front steps of my house and uh, heard about that and that became the big thing. And uh, But uh, this is something that came up and everybody was seemed to, uh, to join together to get the thing done and get it over with. Let me ask you a question that's um, a little broader in perspective. Do, do you feel there was a difference in public opinion uh, regarding the veterans who served in uh, your world, uh, World War II, Korea or Vietnam? Do you feel the people looked at those people differently? There is a difference. There was a difference. It was entirely, and I, uh, my, my, my opinion was it was entirely uh, different situation. I think it was a situation that was brought on by a few people that, uh, well, what can I say? I, I, I don't run the government and I don't make the decisions on it, but there were, there, were, there were mistakes made in the Vietnam War. There were mistakes made in the Korean War. But there were also uh, roadblocks thrown in on both of them where the to get it done and to, there were roadblocks put in the way of the people who were trying to do it. And uh, they, they, they got to be in Vietnam, some of them were insurmountable. And uh, the Vietnam War, I, my oldest boy was in it, and he doesn't talk about it. And uh, I don't blame him. I don't blame him. Uh, it was a, two entirely different situations to a diary of different pl plans. And uh, mm -hmm. you can't take from one and add to the other or vice versa. Have you received any veterans benefits? Uh, did you ever get your teeth fixed, for example? <laughs> oh, Uncle Sam paid for the teeth. <laughs> did he? Okay. And uh, yeah, I, at one time I, at one time after I first got out of the service, I, I was getting a disability. But uh, I had, on the way home, I, as I said, when I left Calcutta to come home on the ship, uh, first 15 days on the ship, I spent in sick bay because I came down with malaria. I spent 28 months over there and uh, never had it, but the minute I got on the ship to come home, I got malaria. So I got a disability pension for about three years. And uh, then they slowly ease the ass off. I'm still categorized as a disabled vet, but zero to 10% disability. 
So yeah, no compensation, but you're still a disabled veteran. Mm. So, what about the GI Bill uh, or insurance? Anything like that? I uh, I kept the insurance for about a year after I got out of the service, and then I let that lapse. So I didn't have that. The GI Bill. Uh, I went to school at Northeastern, uh, not Northeastern, but at uh, Boston University for two and a half years on the GI Bill. And what did you study well, I, there? I specialized in traffic management, transportation. And uh, then I dropped that. I got married, family, and uh, I couldn't get the two to gel, so I let it sit by the wayside and uh, concentrated on the kids. Is there any one thought or incident um, from your military service that you'd like to share with us or your family looking at this tape uh, that you haven't mentioned, but you think people 50 years from now might be interested in knowing uh, about how you felt about something? No, I can't, I can't think of anything. I, as I said, uh, at the time I was called up, I was drafted. I, was, I wasn't the only one that was ever drafted. At that time I felt it was my duty to go ahead and do it, and uh, I did and made the best of it. But uh, no, I, I have no regrets about it. I saw a lot of the world. I saw a lot of, the, saw a lot of places I never would see. And I saw a lot of places that people would pay thousands and thousands of dollars. They will never see. Of course, they probably wouldn't want to see them either. But that's their that's their prerogative. But uh, I enjoyed what I did, and uh, that was it. Bob, we thank you for coming in this morning. My pleasure. Appreciate it very much. You're very eloquent. I hope thank so. you.